They say that the eyes are the window to the soul. If that's so, are we actually giving technology access to our humanity? Think about that. There's a lot of human issues, challenges, problems out there that we can address with technology, but it's important that we know how we're doing it, why we're doing it, when we're doing it, and how we control it. So think about a couple of examples. In Sub-Saharan Africa, the medical system is extremely challenged. They have horrible infrastructure. It is extremely under-resourced. The lack of trained people, the distances that they have to deal with, and the decades of civil war and just discord that's been going on there for, in some places for decades. It just hobbles their system. Simple things like access to blood supplies, access to medical tests results in thousands of people dying in those areas. We heard earlier today about childbirth. 50% of all deaths worldwide in childbirth happen in Sub-Saharan Africa. 50%. The two leading causes, hemorrhaging, severe bleeding, and infections. Two of the easiest things in the world to address if you have the technology in place when you need it. One company called Zipline has a solution in place today. They've created an unmanned aircraft system distribution network for blood and medical tests. They're addressing that problem using drones. They've taken the transport times for blood and medical tests that used to be hours and days in some cases to literally minutes. 30% of all the blood and medical tests in Rwanda today travel by drone. That's amazing. They want to bring that system to the United States. It saves lives every day. In agriculture in the United States, three and a half million acres of lakes and reservoirs are affected by runoff, chemical runoff, herbicides, pesticides, fertilizers. 78% of our continental offshore waters are affected by algae overgrowth because of runoff. Part of the problem is when we look for the data on the field, when we look for data in agriculture, the way we do it is part of the problem. We sample in spots, we sample in sporadic times, and then we extrapolate it to cover large areas and across all the time. Productivity data quite often waits till the end of the season at the harvest to figure out exactly what happened during the rest of the year. So that's part of our problem. We don't have the data to support the things we want to do. So what do we do? We apply the herbicides, the pesticides, the fertilizers on a schedule based on history, based on experience, but it has nothing to do with when things are actually needed, where they're needed, and why they're needed. Some companies are addressing that today with unmanned technologies. A company rated uh, a mad tech in Calvert County is doing that today. They're addressing entire fields and doing it more often, gathering data that they can actually hook in real time to unmanned tractors, unmanned application machines to, to do precision agriculture today. It ends up with chemicals, oversized pesticides, fertilizers being applied where they're needed, when they're needed, for what they're needed. So you reduce the amount of chemicals that you're putting down in the fields. So it increases productivity, but even more so, it ends up in less runoff. It's environmental protection. The EPA is very interested in that. You and I should be very interested in that. Today in the United States, 30,000 human organs a year are transplanted. The key to the organ transplants is viability. The amount of time it takes to go from the donor to the, in, to the recipient patient is critical. Every hour that an organ stays outside the human body results in a decrease in the acceptance rate, surgery success, and the actual life expectancy of an organ in that recipient's body. Every hour results in a 4% reduction in the life expectancy. One example, there's a kidney that came from Atlanta to Baltimore. A couple hour flight, right? 29 hours. Multiply that times 4%. It's done. Just in kidneys alone, we throw away 2,700 kidneys a year in the United States because we can't get them to where they're needed quickly enough. 20% of all the donated kidneys in the United States are tossed in the garbage because of this. We rely on an antiquated transportation system that relies on existing nodes and people and money and all the things that exist already with nothing being done specifically for the organ transportation system itself. So what do we do? One possible solution, an unmanned system distribution network, just like in Africa. A combination of driverless cars and drones to move the organs when they're needed, from where they're needed to where they're needed, in real time, on demand. 
The system you see on the screen there moved a human organ about four miles up the road here last March for the first time in human history. A human organ carried on a drone. In about a month, knock on wood, a similar aircraft is going to be carrying a human organ very near here to a patient waiting for that organ on an operating table. Again, for the first time in human history. Groundbreaking stuff. It is literally going to save thousands of lives every year. At Google, they write algorithms that predict what you want to buy, even when you don't know you want to buy it. <laughs> and it's very effective, uncannily so sometimes. Those exact same algorithms, with just a few tweaks, can predict your internet habits. What sites do you visit? What sites don't you visit? Which bank accounts don't you check quite often, as often as you should? And it will use those avenues to accomplish identity theft. Very easily. So what's the common thread across all these things? It's a continuum of capability. We'll talk a little bit about what that continuum looks like, but it's from remote vehicles all the way to artificial intelligence, where we're going to end up talking today. It's also technology being connected in nodes and architectures and networks, sharing the information, sharing the processing power. But at its core, it's about connections of the people. It's the users, the end users of the products, the applications, connected to researchers, connected to industry, connected to regulators, connected to the general public, because we get to decide what we're going to do with it all. And what do we really want to do, and what maybe we don't want to do, and where do we draw the lines? And that's a critical piece of all this. We gain capability by networking things together, but we also can go over control. At the low end of the spectrum, you have the remote piloted vehicles, or remote vehicles. All they do is they remove the human with a physical connection from the system, from the application. They do sensing, they may do a little processing, but really they're just remoting the human. The human is still making the decisions, the human is still accomplishing the actions. When you get up to things like driverless cars, now you have automation involved. So you have the, process, the sensing and the processing, but now it's starting to take some actions. But they're reactions, they're pre-programmed actions based on inputs. With machine learning, now you start to see human-type thinking. Not only is it gathering data, processing the data, it's actually starting to change the way it processes the data based on its own experience, based on experience it's gathering from other sources. And finally, at artificial intelligence, you link it all together. You're sensing, you're processing, you're learning, you're gathering, you're making decisions and carrying out actions with a human not in the loop. The only human interaction is the design of that system. After that, the system has total control. All these are based on networks and nodes about where they share information, where they share processing, where they share decision making, and where they share actions. A lot of people like to talk about some of the scary scenarios, and there's lots of them out there. You hear a lot of discussion about the singularity. The singularity, right? It's where machines become all-knowing. All the knowledge of the world is suddenly connected. And everything, every machine knows all the information that's out there in the world. The machines become self-aware. And very quickly after they become self-aware, they become self-acting. That event, if you listen to futurists, will occur in about 25 to 40 years. They all agree pretty much no more than 40 years from now that could happen. So how do we control that? Do we want to control that? How do we control that? We limit the applications of AI. We put boundaries and parameters around what we want to give up. What do we want artificial intelligence to actually do for us? The even bigger danger in my mind than the singularity is right now, and it's pervasive. It's disconnectedness. We lose ourselves, and we lose the connections with each other. And that's important that as we think about what we don't want to give up, one of the biggest things we don't want to give up, in fact, we cannot give up is touch, the human touch, our connections with each other. Quantum networks are very complex systems that operate based, again, on nodes and networks. They're very complex, they're self-forming, self-healing, and the information is shared, the processing is very complex. Human networks are the exact same thing. It's how we share our knowledge, how we share our processing amongst ourselves, how we share the decision-making amongst ourselves, and the actions that we accomplish as a team. It's about nothing more than relationships. As we move forward, we want to make sure that we push that human element into our research, to 
make sure that relationships are actually part of our research, that we understand what those human connections are. We want to make sure that empathy is actually driven into the research. We should care about what we're doing. We should make sure that the research cares about the outcome. Drive it into that. Leadership is going to be a critical element throughout all of this. In fact, it already has already been proven that it is. But we have to be very careful about who's leading, who's driving the bus. The researcher, we need to make sure that we're understanding what we're doing, why we're doing it, where we're doing it. What's the outcome that we're really driving for? The three C's, as my leadership experience has shown, the three C's work wonderfully here. Courage, competency, courage, and compassion. The competency to know what it is we're supposed to be doing. The courage to make decisions, the hardest is draw lines and stick to them, and sometimes push beyond our fears. And the compassion to make sure that the outcomes that we're driving for are actually the outcomes we need, and the outcomes that we want. That compassion of purpose. When we use all three of those seeds together in a connected environment, we end up with the best possible outcomes. We use social media, virtual reality, and the internet to expand our horizons, expand our knowledge, and we think to expand our relationships, and they do in some ways. But as we push forward with unmanned technologies, we've sure, we got to make sure we don't lose the human touch. Because these people are all together, right? But are they? We need to make sure we don't lose that human touch. A really tragic example of this recently had that leap to technology without considering the humanity part of it. An elderly gentleman and his family were in a hospital waiting for some communication from the doctors. The doctor rolled in and they unexpectedly found out that the gentleman had a few months to live from a tele-connected remote doctor. As we push into artificial intelligence and allowing artificial intelligence to do things for us, we need to care about this piece, the humanity piece, to make sure we retain our humanity in the decision making and in the actions. Science fiction has always liked to kind of scare us, at least a little bit. And usually that scary aspect has come when the technology is disconnected from the humanity. But every once in a while, they throw that little piece of humanity in there to remind us it matters. What are the possibilities? What happens if we remember the humanity part and that human touch part. From when we were very small, we all realized the inherent value of relationships and our connections. We knew that we had to lean on each other and it was always a lot more fun when we were all in this together, all in the same direction. It's only as we grow older that we realize we can limit those relationships. We can control those relationships. We can make them do what we want them to do. Not always to our benefit. It's important for us to remember the value of those relationships and the value of those connections. It's important to remember how important they are. In fact, they are the only reason for living is those relationships. Here's your homework. Who are you going to have that public conversation with or that very private conversation with? Tonight, tomorrow, next week, in the next hour. Who is that person you're going to reach out to your family member, your friend group, somebody sitting right next to you, or right in front of you, right now. That you're going to talk about what you want to see in the future. What do you want to see in your future? How involved are you going to be in this discussion? Because it's all of us that are driving the bus. As much as we want to think that somebody else is going to watch out for us, we are driving the bus. So that's your homework. Who are you going to have that conversation with? Who is that person you're going to reach out now and tell this is what my competency, this is what my courage, this is what my compassion is for our future together and I want to share it with you. Thank you.